What's going on guys? John Elder here from CodingMe.com and in this video, we're going to look at custom error pages and version control with Flask and Python. Alright guys, like I said, in this video, we're going to look at custom error pages and version control. But before we get started, if you like this video and want to see more like it, be sure to smash the like button below, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm, and check out CodingMe.com where I have dozens of courses with hundreds of videos that teach you to code. Use coupon code YouTube1 to get $30 off membership with all my courses, videos, and books. One time fee of just $49, which is insanely cheap. Okay, we are moving right along with Flask Friday, the best day of the week. <laughs> and I hope you guys are going to have a good weekend. I have got absolutely nothing planned this weekend. It's very nice. So in this video, we're going to look at creating custom error pages. So you go to a page that doesn't exist, for instance, ASDA. You get this, you know, 404 error, error page not found. And you know, web servers have error codes like error 404 or 500, there's a server error, internal server error. You may have seen these errors throughout the internet over the years as you've been you know, checking out web pages. You go to a page that doesn't exist, you get an error. And uh, you want to create custom error pages that are nicer than this, and we'll make them look nicer than this later. But in this video, I'm going to show you how to create the custom error pages, and then later on, we'll make them look nice. So you, know, you can put your own branding and stuff, and maybe you can redirect to another page or show a sitemap with you know, that page doesn't exist, but check out these pages or whatever you want to do. And I'll show you how to do that in this video. We're also going to take a minute just to set up version control. We haven't done that yet. And it's usually something you want to do at the beginning of any project. So I'll show you how to do that. If you already know how to do version control with Git and GitHub, you can skip over that. It'll be the last part of the video. Uh, but for now, we're going to work on these error codes. So let's head over to our code. And this is the hello.py file we've been working on up until now. And to create custom error pages, we just have to create a new a couple of new routes and functions. So let's come down here and create custom error pages. And the first one we'll create is invalid URL. Can't find a page. You go to a web page that doesn't exist. And so to do this, we just we create an app instance. But instead of creating an actual route, Flask has sort of a, a mechanism to deal with these things that we can call on. And it's just app.error handler. And then we pass in the code that we want, 404. And you can look up these uh, server error codes. There's a Wikipedia page that lists them. There's you know dozens of them, 400, 404, you know, 500, 50, whatever. Uh, there's a couple of main ones, and we're just going to do the two sort of most popular ones, 404 and 500. Uh, but this is how you do it. So that will create that. Now we just create our function. So let's go define. And this is a page underscore not underscore found. And we need to pass in the error, right? And then we just do the same thing we do up here almost. So I can just copy this return thing here. So we want to return render a template. Which one do we want to render? We want to render 404.html. Now we haven't created that yet. We'll do that in just a second. And we don't need to pass in any variables like we did earlier. So, okay. Now there's one more thing. At the end of this, you got to slap a comma and then put the actual error code. So 404. This is, this will get passed into this function. So then this page not found function sort of is looking for this argument to be passed. And so you do that. So that's really all there is to it. So we can copy this whole thing and just come down here and let's say uh, internal server error. It's a common one. And that one is error 500. So the, the server kind of dies on you, something happens internally. Uh, it's uh, unhandled exception, anything like that. Uh, this will throw a 500 error. And then here we want to redirect to page 500 and then pass 500. So really that is all there is to it. Now we just need to create these two pages in the regular way we create any template. And we'll learn how to do that in the last video. We come up here to templates, right click new file. And I'm just going to file save as, and we'll call this one 404.html. Then I'm going to do it again. So templates, new file, save as 500.html. And then inside of these, we can put anything we want. So just for now, I'm going to put uh, like a line break. Let's center this. And let's go H1. Let's just type in 404 error. And then down here, let's just go page not found. And again, this, this doesn't look pretty. Try again. But it will get the job done. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this save this file, come over here to our 500. And then for here, let's go 500 uh, internal server error. 
And instead of page not found, let's just go try again. Okay, so that looks good. So let's head back over to our terminal, make sure we're in our C flask or drive, make sure our virtual environment's turned on, make sure the server is running. Then we can come back over here to our web page. We can go to any page that doesn't exist. So uh, join.html, we don't have that page. Uh oh, we have an error right there. What did I do? Zoop. Ah, right here, no colon right there. So of course, okay, it's Friday. We always make mistakes on Friday. Flask Friday is not immune to the mistakes. So, okay, so app error handler, no colon there, no colon there. Go ahead and save this, head back over here, hit reload, boom, 404 error, page not found. And you know, this is join.html. We can put just any kind of gobbledygook in there. And again, page not found, try again. So pretty easy to do these custom error pages. And you know, every website should have this, just a very common thing. So now I wanna talk about version control. And if you're familiar with any kind of coding, you're probably already familiar with version control. It allows us to back up our code, keep track of it over time. If there's a mistake, we can roll it back to a previous version that worked. Uh, it's good for teams, it's good for solo people. It's just the best practices when it comes to coding. And it'll also help us because we can push our code up to GitHub, and then later on, we can also push our same Git repository up to web hosting, for instance, Heroku, for our web hosting. So we really sort of need this if we wanna make this a real website up on the internet. Right now, we're just running this on localhost, uh, but uh, it's just something you're always gonna to wanna to do. So head back over here. Let's control C to break out of our server. Now, our virtual environment is turned on. I'm gonna go ahead and deactivate it. And we'll turn it back on in a minute. And the reason this is, is because we need to create some SSH keys. So we're going to create a Git repository to save all of our Git code, our version control code. Then we're also gonna push that up to GitHub. And to do that, we need an SSH key, a secure SSH key that allows the two to connect securely and for them to be able to verify you are who you say you are and you're pushing the code to the right account and all that good stuff. So we need to create an SSH key. And if you haven't done that before, this is how we do it. So let's CD into the tilde forward slash directory. And if we PWD, this is the main sort of default directory that should come up whenever you open git bash, if you're on a Windows computer. And mine is C users Codemy because Codemy is my Windows logged in username. Yours will say something different, but that's fine. So the first thing we need to do is make a directory to hold our SSH key. So mkdir, and now this needs to be a hidden directory. So dot SSH and the dot makes it a hidden directory. So we could do that, it'll create that. Now we need to move into that directory to create our key. So cd change directory dot SSH. And you can see we are now in there. We can confirm that with PWD. We're in C users codemy dot SSH. So, okay, so, so far so good. We can ls, we can see there's nothing in there. So to create an SSH key for Windows users, it is just SSH keygen.exe. And that's really all you have to do. Now it's saying, where do we wanna save this? We wanna save it right here, so I'll just hit enter. It's asking for a password. I don't ever put one, so I just hit enter again, hit enter again, and it's been created. Now, if you put a password in there, every time you try to use this thing, it'll ask for that password. And if you forget that password, you're gonna to have to regenerate the key all over again, and it won't be usable. So this is already a secure thing. I don't see a need to put a password on it, so I never do. So, okay, we've generated our SSH key, and we can tell that by typing ls, and we can see here is the key. There's two of them, a private one and a public one. The public one is the one we're interested in. That's the one we're going to need for GitHub. So we can actually see it. We could type the catalog command, and we need to do this. So catalog id underscore rsa dot pub, and we hit enter, and this is our SSH key. So we need to copy this, so highlight it like this, drag your mouse, highlight the whole thing, and then right click and copy. Now we need to head over to GitHub and add this key to our GitHub account. Now if you don't have a GitHub account, go ahead and sign up, it's completely free. Go ahead and do that. And then when you're logged into your account, come over here to settings, and then look through here for SSH and GPG keys. So we click on that, and you can see I've got a bunch of them already. We wanna add a new one. And then we just come down here, right click and paste in that key. And then we hit enter. It's gonna ask for your password again. It's been a while since I logged in. And boom, it's been added. So now, anytime you try to connect to GitHub from your terminal, it'll use that key, it will recognize that it's you, and everything will be fine. Okay, so let's head back over to the terminal and let's set up our version control. So we can clear the screen. We need to move back into our Flask project. So CD, C forward slash Flasker. 
And yep, there it is. Now, before we get started, we're going to push all of this stuff up to GitHub, but we don't need to push our virtual environment up to GitHub. That really doesn't have anything to do with our Flask project per se. I mean, it's an important part of the project, but we don't need to save that for version control purposes. So we need to tell Git to ignore that whole directory. And we can do that by creating a git ignore file. So to do that, I'm just going to type touch dot git ignore. And the, the period in front of this, just like our SSH directory, means that this file is hidden. So, okay, we can do that. Now, if we type in ls, you can see it doesn't even show up there. But if we head back over to our sublime text, you can see, boom, there it is, git ignore. If we open it, there's nothing in there. So inside of here, we could type in dot git ignore and then vert and then the floor forward slash. We're saying, hey, we want to we want git to ignore this vert directory. So go ahead and save this control S or come up here and file save and then go ahead and close this. Now we're done with that. We can ignore that forevermore, right? But it needs to be there and now it's there and uh, that should be good. So, OK, now let's set up our version control. So head over to codemy.com forward slash git. And here are the instructions for sitting, setting up version control for any project. And I've been using these five commands for like 20 years. I don't remember what they do or why we use them. I just remember every time I want to set up Git for a project, and you should do this for every project you create, we just copy in these commands into the terminal. And we have to modify the first two with our name and an email address, but the rest of them we just copy and paste in there. So, all right, let's go ahead and do this. Let's copy this first one head back over to our terminal. And we need to turn on our virtual environment first. So let's go source, vert, scripts, activate. And we can see now our version, our virtual environment has been turned on, right? So that's good. So let's type in that first command. So let's paste it in. It's git config dash dash global user dot name and then type in your name. Why does it need your name? Because version control keeps track of the changes of your code over time. So it needs to know who you are so it could say, hey, John Elder made these changes to the code, right? So it needs to know your name. So, okay, that's the first one. And now let's come over to the second one. And this is email address. And again, same deal here. We need your actual email address. So it can keep track of who you are and stuff. Okay. And the other three, we could just copy and paste. So one at a time, we just come through here, control C to copy or right click and copy. Right click and paste. Boom. There's one. Then there's this one. And the last one I do always remember it's git init. And that stands for initialize. This will turn git on and it'll start everything. So we can paste this in here, hit enter, and you'll notice now it says master here on our prompt. That means that git has been initialized. That means git is working. And that means this is we're on our master branch. It's the main branch. Now, this will change in just a second when we set up GitHub. But for now, it says master and that's good. So, okay, we've created a, a Git repository. Now we need to sort of turn it on, right? We've sort of installed it. Now we need to turn it on. And to do that, we type in git add period. And then we type in git commit dash am and then put a little message here. So I'm going to say initial commit. So a commit is anytime you're saving your code, you're committing it to the repository. And so whenever you do that, you want to type a little message to explain why you're doing it. So if we made a major change to our index.html page, I would type in changed index.html page, right? Just a little descriptive message to say what you just did. And we'll see in a minute why that's important. So, okay, we can hit enter there. It's added six files and 85 insertions. You can see a list of all the stuff, hello.py, our templates files. You'll notice there's no mention of vert because we set up that git ignore file. So, okay, we've now committed it. Now we need to push this to GitHub. And to do that, we have to set up a repository on GitHub the first time. After that, it'll remember it. But for the first time, we have to set it up. So let's head back over to GitHub and come over to our account here. And we can click on your repositories. And you can see I've got a bunch of repositories. Now we just click on new and let's go ahead and name this. I'm going to call this Flasker or yeah, Flasker. That works <laughs> right now. This can be public or private and both of these are free. I tend to keep all my stuff public because I'm a teacher and I want my students to be able to see it. 
Even if I wasn't, I would probably keep it public unless it's like some super secret startup that you're working on and you don't want the code to be visible. It, when it's public, anybody in the world can see your code. That's not such a bad thing, especially if you're trying to create a reputation for yourself. If you're trying to get a job, your potential new boss is going to want to see your GitHub code before they hire you. It's a, an interview topic Then you know, you might come in for a coding interview and they might sit down, pull up your GitHub and then go through it and say, okay, tell me about this. And you can talk about it, right? It's a common interview thing. So keeping your stuff public is not a bad idea. I tend to do that, but if you need to keep it private for whatever reason, you can click private here and uh, either way it's free. So uh, just come down here and click create repository. And when you do, you get this next page that shows you the next instructions. So to set this thing up, we've already added our SSH key here. So we're all good there, but we need to add these three commands to our terminal because we've already got an existing repository on our command line in our terminal. We need to push it from there. So that's, these are the instructions to push an existing repository from the command line. You can ignore all of this stuff. We just care about this stuff. So all we have to do is copy each of these and paste them in. So copy, head back over to our terminal, paste. Okay. Then the next one is git branch in main. Now this is kind of new. GitHub just started doing this a few months ago. It used to be before I hit enter, you notice this main, our, our master branch is called master. They want our master branch to be called main. And the reason why they did that is social engineering. Uh, master is a, an evil connotation. It, it sort of refers to slaves and masters and that's not politically correct anymore. Of course not. So now they've changed it to say main and you can see now it says main. I, I don't know, whatever makes them happy. So we'll do it. Finally, we need to push our code and we use this third command for that. Copy this, paste it in, hit enter. And now this will push. It's saying, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, we do. Uh, it's found our SSH keys and it pushed our code. So we should be done. We can head back over to GitHub now and hit reload on this page. And here's all of our code, right? So it's GitHub slash flat planet. I don't think the world is flat. I just find it hilarious that some people do. So that's my username. And then Flasker, this is our repository. And you can see we can click on any of these things. And this is our actual code. It's saved. It's backed up. It's safe here. If our computer explodes here, our code is safe up on GitHub. If our house burns down, our office burns down, our code is safe on GitHub. If our girlfriend throws our computer out the window, which has been known to happen, our code is safe on GitHub. And you'll notice this initial commit. That's that message we typed in earlier. So this is really nice at a glance, you can see changes. So for instance, if we change this to uh, something else, so let's come back over to our code. Let's make a material change, right? So internal server error, I want to also put thing. <laughs> I don't know, there's a major change. We added one word, right? Or maybe we came up here, try again. Maybe we typed in uh, something went wrong. Try again. Okay, so we save this. Let's take this off of here because that's a silly thing. Okay, so we made a change to our 500.html page. We added this little thing. What do we do now, Git wise, right? We wanna back this up. We wanna push it to GitHub. How do we do it from here on out? So anytime you wanna make a change and save it to your GitHub or your Git repository, this is what you do. You go through these three steps. You type in Git, add, period. This adds everything from your project to Git. Now we need to commit it. So git commit dash am. And now we type our little message. Let's go uh, tweaked 500.html page, right? Okay. And you can see only one file changed, one insertion, uh, one deletion. We deleted a little thing on the index page. Now we need to push this up to GitHub. And to do that forevermore, we just type git push. Hit enter. It's doing its thing. And it's done. Now we can head back over here and hit reload. And you can see here it says tweaked500.html because somewhere in this directory, that's what we did. So this is nice, right at a glance, we can see changes over time to our code. If we need to hunt something down, it's a great way to do it. That's why we type in those little comments. That's why they should be descriptive. And that's the whole purpose of that. So now we can click on this and we can see, yep, here it is, tweaked500.html because this is the file we changed. All the rest of these files we didn't change, so they still say initial commit. We can click on this and we can see something went wrong. It sure enough 
it, it did that. Now, if we want to see the changes over time to this file, we can click on history and we can see here is the initial commit. Here is the tweaked one. We can click on this one. We can see here's that original code before the changes. And it's not just that page, it's everything. So we can come through here to our 500.html. We can see it, it only says try again there versus if we come back here to this one, well, it's the most current one. So if we want to see it, we have to come back here and we can see it right there. So very cool and uh, really, really easy. And just get in the habit of backing up your code every once in a while. I tend to back up my code right before I'm about to do something big, because then if I do something big and I mess it up, I can just re-download the code before I messed it up. Then after I do a big thing and I confirm that it works, then I'll save it again after that. I don't save it every five minutes. I don't save it every 10 minutes. I don't save it every hour usually, unless there's a specific reason to. Generally, if I'm working on code, I, I do it at the beginning of whatever I'm doing and then at the end. So if I'm working on a website for eight hours, when I start, I'll, I'll, I'll save it. When I finish, I'll save it. Unless there's been a big thing sometime in the middle of there where I'm like, yeah, I should probably back this up just in case, then I'll do it then too. But you know, for the most part, you don't have to do it like every time you make some little tiny change. Just whenever you do a big change, be sure and back it up and push it to GitHub, GitHub, and you should be good to go. So those are custom error pages, very important. And we're going to see some strategies to using these uh, for all kinds of fun things in the future. Uh, very easy to do and uh, pretty cool. And that's version control. You should always do this for every project you create. Every time you create a new project, you'll go through this whole thing again. You don't have to create an SSH key every time. You can use this same SSH key forever for all your projects. But if you haven't done it, you need to create one, right? Uh, other than that, every time you create a new project, you're going to have to go through those five steps that we saw on the codeme.com website. These five things, every time you create a new project, this will set up your version control for that project. You should not share version control between projects. Your version control should just be for one project. If you have a new project, you set up a whole new version control just for that project. I know some people want to be like, I set up version control three projects ago. I want to use it for this one. How do I do that? No, 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 you don't want to do that. You always create a new version control and then you'll come to GitHub here. And like I said, you'll have a bunch of repositories. You can see I've got 64 repositories. I've got 64 projects hosted on there. You don't want one project with everything in it. You want separate projects, separate repositories for each project. So uh, pretty simple and pretty cool. So that's all for this video. If you liked it, be sure to smash the like button below, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. And check out codeb.com where you can use coupon code YouTube1 to get $30 on memberships. You pay just $49 to access all my courses, over 47 courses, hundreds of videos, and the PDFs of all my best selling coding books. Join over 100,000 students learning to code just like you. My name is John Elder from codeb.com, and I'll see you in the next video.